Hello, comrades, and welcome back to Ushanka Show. Здравствуйте, дорогие товарищи. В эфире программа Ушанка Show. In today's video, we're going to continue a topic that I started in my video number 155, Peculiar Behaviors of the Soviet Workers. That video actually right now is my number one trending video on the Shanka Show and got over 500 likes and 184 comments so far. So thank you so much for your interest in this topic. And we're going to talk some more about peculiar behaviors of other Soviet people. And a quick refresher. In that video, we talked about New Sunni. New Sunni, it's like a plural form of New Sun. So the people, workers, they were stealing stuff from their factories. As I mentioned before, Nisuni, those were predominantly blue collar workers. So of course, obvious question, so what about so called white collar people, like managers, directors of the factories and so on? Did they do anything naughty in the Soviet socialist system? And a quick reminder, a lot of times, you had to be a communist to be in some kind of managerial position. So if you want to become a white collar, a manager, director, one of the requirements, you must be a member of Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So what do you think, comrades? The Soviet communists were also doing something naughty at their places of work, where they're trying to steal something of value at the places that they managed. Well, curiously enough, Soviet people, and maybe it was even before the Soviet Union, had this famous saying, Selotka всегда гниет с головы, which you can translate loosely like the herring or any dead fish starts rotting from the head first. So first the head is getting bad, then the rest of the body. But before we start talking about white collar crimes in the Soviet Union, I need to introduce you to the interesting organization that's called OBHSS and it's abbreviation for Отдел по борьбе с ищениями социалистической собственности и спекуляцией which you can translate as a department. Борьба, it means usually struggle or battle so in this case you can just say it's a department uh, against embezzlement or in other word maybe you can use misappropriations but I like word embezzlement uh, of the socialist property so first of all we have this new term socialist property and we have a organization the department that was um, fighting against embezzlement of the socialist property so if you look back to the origins of the Soviet Union beginning from revolution, October revolution, 1917. The whole idea was to destroy the old system as they saw in the international, we're going to destroy the whole world of oppression and then we're going to build our own brand new world on top of it. So the whole idea was that we're going to destroy all the bad things that capitalism brings and all with it we won't need any more army we won't need police and any other things because now people will be free and life will be beautiful and i'm very weak on all these theories so but it sounds like initially there was a, some kind of concept of anarcho-communism going on so pretty much we don't need army because every worker will have a rifle and if any problem happens, we all just gather together, fight the bad guys, and then we come back to our factories and continue building communism. So across the board, it was pretty much the hope that people will be self-controlling, self-organizing. So I see it as an anarcho-communism. But pretty soon the reality knocked on the Soviet door and a lot of changes started happening. We created the Red Army which was Trotsky idea and we created OBHSS in 1937 under NKVD cover so that was a grandpa of KGB they created department for uh, battling the embezzlement of socialist property another interesting detail about the situation 
with socialist property that that term didn't exist until 1932. And it's actually, that was, I think, uh, what I found that was, can be credited to Comrade Stalin that he originated the term in 1932, socialist property. And by definition, socialist property was two kinds of properties, state property, which like all people's property, and that's land, forests, any bodies of waters like lakes and rivers, any mineral resources, factories, and so on. So that was state property as a part of the socialist property. The second part of the socialist property was collective property. So there's properties that belong to collective farms. So now we're talking anything that collective farms had, horses, pigs, uh, whatever. And so-called, they also had cooperatives. So that was a collective property or so-called group property. So what the government said, okay, now we have the socialist property and you can touch this. Do, 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 do. So along with the new term socialist property in 1932, government introduced the term хищение социалистической собственности. So the embezzlement of the social property. And it had punishment for doing that. And curiously enough that Stalin blamed situation with embezzlement on the anti-social people, kulaks, and capitalist elements. So basically he's like, I know the workers and collective farm workers won't steal their own stuff. It's only those anti-social elements as well as the kulaks, which is like rich uh, villagers, and people that still have capitalist mentality, that's the ones they're stealing. So we need to have a severe punishment for doing that. And if you studied Soviet Union history, you should know by now that 1932 was a pretty ugly year. That's when the starvation started in Soviet Union, Volga region, uh, people were starving, Ukraine people were starving. So... The punishment for embezzlement of the socialist property was quite hard. It was at least 10 years of labor camps up to execution by the firing squad. So that's 1932. Five years later, there was a special department created, Oberhai SS, that had the job just to uh, fight against embezzlement of the socialist property and speculation. So after you embezzle, a lot of people tried to sell it to make profit, so that's speculation. So it started pretty much in 1932, five years later, OBHSS was born. And this department was transferred later from NKVD, or is that KGB pretty much, to MVD, to Ministerstvo Vnutrinih Dial, or the Department of the Inner Affairs. And from there, uh, from 1946, it was very busy all the way to 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. By 1940, this department had 100,000 people working there. So you can imagine the scale of embezzlement going on in the Soviet Union if the department had to hire 100,000 people. And that's on the top of unofficial helpers, I couldn't call them uh, agents, the Russian word is asvidemitil, that's the people who report uh, quietly on other people. So they had about 60,000 reporters, wink, wink, on the top of 100,000 people that were fighting embezzlement of the socialist property. So Obehaya says they didn't care much about New Sunni, blue-collar workers, quietly carrying stuff out of the factories. But they're uh, watching for directors of retail stores, warehouses, pretty much all the places when upper management had access to goods and watching that they don't do any ways they can steal products or steal cash. Actually, I just recalled uh, there is a famous singer, uh, Soviet singer, Russian singer, Alexander Rosenbaum, and he has a lot of songs, kind of like this criminal motifs. It's about life of criminals. And so one of the songs was actually dedicated somewhat to OBHSS. It's a song about this young guy who had an amazing life. He had a bunch of money. He was buying uh, 
foreign expensive goods and jeans and he was going to the bars and dating pretty girls and as like one of the expression when you reach and you don't care you open the door with a kick so you kick the doors and he said двери в баре рестораны открывал ногой so I opened the doors to the bars and restaurants with a kick and then one day a couple strangers in the gray suits visited his father and it turned out they came from Oberhaisess. His dad got arrested and sent to Siberia. They lost their apartment. Uh, they lost all their savings. And now he is poor and broke. And the girl he, they used to date is not paying attention to him. Okay, so now since you guys know pretty good about Oberhaisess, I think you are ready. So in my next video, we'll talk about the most famous criminal cases that uh, happened in the Soviet Union involving OPHSS and embezzlement of the socialist property. Okay, I hope you guys like this video. Shapka Ushanka. Today we're going to continue the topic of embezzlement of socialist property and we'll talk some more about OPHSS. This topic I started in my video number 157. So we'll talk some more about department against embezzlement or misappropriation of socialist property. So OBHSS was pretty much the economic and financial crimes police and they didn't bother much chasing Nisuni workers that were carrying stuff out of their factories. That topic I covered in my video number 155 Peculiar Behaviors of the Soviet Workers. On a local level OBHSS was famous for making unannounced inspections of retail stores in Russian retail store like Shapsko Magazine. Confused me for many years when I tried to say store I would say magazine or magazine and it's a completely different word, right? So they did a lot of it. They just show up unannounced to the retail store, lock it up and they start inspecting, checking uh, how much items they have for sale, how much cash they have, what were the sales, uh, trying to uh, check in their scales, see if they, uh, you know, cheating customers using scales, same with warehouses. So that's what OBHSS did a lot is harassing a retail part of uh, Soviet economy. And I'm saying harassing, like making sure they don't steal excessively. But generally, like big picture, OBHSS was after white collar crimes and it's involved, you know, managers of the large retail stores, whole republics, factories, and also they were after so-called tsikhaviki. I'm planning to make a separate video about it, but that's the people that organized underground factories, pretty much like small shops, where they're producing shoes, clothing, and such, which was totally illegal in Soviet Union. So there were a lot about uncovering those guys. And I have no doubt a lot of the cases were classified, but there are some cases were actually made public in order, I guess, to intimidate and scare any other uh, criminals. So before we're going to talk about the most ill-famous criminal cases uncovered by OBHSS, we need to talk about the role of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. I don't think you'll be surprised if I tell you that Soviet Union was quite a unique country. And one of the unique features of the Soviet Union was that its political system was monopolized by a single party. So Communist Party of the Soviet Union was the only political party in the country. So you can be Bespartini, so you, like, you don't belong to any party, or you could be communist, you belong to the communist party, so there's no other alternatives. So picture, and maybe a lot of people would be happy if, for example, Democratic Party would be outlawed in Soviet Union, I mean, in Soviet Union, United States, they'll be called uh, enemies of the people. Sometimes Donald Trump drops that term animals of the people or traitors, which is kind of scares me. You know, you ship everyone who said they're Democrat to Alaska to cut down trees. And then you have just one party that uh, runs the political system in the country. 
And to be fair, a single party system it actually makes a lot of things much easier. It will be easy to do elections, right? You got a single candidate from the single party, uh, so you will save a lot of money. You don't need to do all the uh, advertising on TV, radio, internet. But of course, there's other problem. If any problems arise in the country, who are you going to blame? Since you're the single party, then you have to find somebody overseas or across the border to blame for your problems, right? But I don't see even, okay, this kind of case happened. We have just one party in America that the Republican Party will be pretty much like everywhere. You want to mean everywhere? The Communist Party of Soviet Union, and I'm trying to come up with the correct verb, it penetrated, permeated, I don't know what else to say, everywhere. Like, we're talking from the top level to the bottom. It was like a two parallel structures of power. So, for example, every factory would have a, a top communist person will be talent director, like, and watching him, like, how the things are going. Are you working and doing your quotas and keeping up with the five-year plan? And he would respond to somebody who is in charge of the whole region, and it goes up and up and up the chain of command all the way to the General Secretary of Communist Party of Soviet Union. And even to think about it, like, if you ask who was leader of the Soviet Union in 1980s, and everyone would answer Leonid Brezhnev, but he was General Secretary of Communist Party. Technically, I believe it was Gromyka, the last name. He was the actual leader of the Soviet Union because he was председатель президиума Верховного Совета СССР. I don't want to try and translate it, but he was technically, Gromyka was technically the leader of the Soviet Union, but that was pretty much technicality. The real leader was the General Secretary of Communist Party. That's how hardcore party was holding whole country in its grip. So why am I like a broken record, just repeat party, communist party, communist leader, local communist leaders. I hope, I mean, there's a slight hope. I mean, I'm losing hope for the humankind, but there's a slight hope that people who don't understand why Soviet Union collapsed and they blame for example, like Gorbachev, like he, there's some theories that he was a CIA agent introduced uh, to destroy Soviet Union. Maybe this video somewhat explains or opens eyes like what the main reason why Soviet Union collapsed. The reality is because Communist Party penetrated the whole economy, the whole life of the Soviet Union, any large scale economical crime wouldn't happen without local communist leaders knowing about it and participating in it. This is the main kind of conclusion that I come up with, and I think you will too, the, because every factory had communist leaders, every region had communist leaders overseeing leaders below and reporting to communists above. Anything large-scale economical crime wouldn't happen without local communists taking bribes and participating in it. So the system was sick. The system was full of corruption, of cancer. And as I mentioned, I have the saying that Silotka always, uh, Silotka always, that the fish always start rotting from its head. And that's an example how the whole big Soviet fish was rotting and was rotting from its head. Okay, uh, now let's take a look at some most impressive, famous cases that happened in the Soviet Union. The earliest one I found was dated to 1969, so-called Azerbaijani case. So this is 16 years after the death of Stalin. And you may say, okay, you see, Stalin died and now corruption blossomed in the Soviet Union. Maybe. So first of all, you know, we had a Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and then we had another 15 Communist Party of each republic. So Ukraine had the Communist Party of Ukraine, and Azerbaijan had a Communist Party of Azerbaijan. So when the new leader came, 
something wasn't looking right and it was discovered that in Azerbaijan existed a price list for government positions. Think about it. In the Soviet Union and socialist system, there was price list for different government positions. So, for example, judge, the price of that position was 30,000 rubles. And that's 1969 when average salary was 100 rubles. 30,000 rubles to become a judge. 50,000 rubles to become a local, uh, like a sh uh, sheriff. So we're called militia, so police. So local uh, militia sheriff was 50,000 rubles. To become a secretary, Communist Party secretary of the local, like area Raikom, was 100,000 rubles. Huge money actual price list for the government positions. So let's pause for a second and think. Why would anybody want to pay 50,000 rubles to become a local police sheriff? You know, it's not like, oh, I really want my son to be a, in a police force. It's because there was already a system in place of bribes, so you knew that if you get that position, People be paying you bribes for whatever they're doing. So there was this giant corruption net. And if you want to pick some warm place, sweet place to collect cash, you have to pay up front. So you like invest in money to get a position when you can get a nice flow of bribes coming from people and businesses. Gastronom Yelisevsky case in Moscow. Soviet Russia. Its director, Yuri Sakalov, was running a large retail bribery operation going on from 1972 till 1982. Gastronom, it means grocery store, and that one was actually quite a historical uh, gastronom. It was open in 1901, so before the revolution, and Yuri Sakalov, its director, he tried very hard to have his store full of foods, food items. So he actually created a system of bribing. So he was paying bribes to get groceries to his store. And then he was getting paid for the, by other directors from other grocery stores to get some items for themselves. So there was this whole system of circulating grocery items like deficitne especially hard to get uh, foodstuffs and there was a lot of bribes going back and forth okay comrades and now it's time to learn some soviet era russian retail terms and the first one is targovlya is pod prilavka or trading from below the countertop because of the shortage of quite a few food items People at the grocery stores weren't interested to sell to any person some hard-to-get items, for example, like smoked sturgeon or some nice cuts of meats or whatever. So what they would do, they'll hide it items under the countertop. So if you look at the Soviet grocery stores, usually you know it's a table like a countertop has a scale, and then behind the, there'll be display of canned goods cheese, bread, whatever. And what would they do? They will hide on the countertop some deficit items. And then they will sell it to their friends or they will sell it for more money. So, for example, if you want a kilogram of smoked fish and the price usually is 50 kopecks a kilo, you might get it for 3 rubles a kilo if you know who has it and they will sell you this pod prilavka. They will sell you from that hiding spot on the countertop that not everyone, uh, not many people could see. So that's a famous Targovlya uh, prilavka selling goods from below the countertop. So that means there'll be some deficit items sold only to specific people. Another popular Soviet retail term was Targovlya z Chornova Hoda or selling from the back door. So, the not the back door, like emergency exit, I guess you can call it back door. 
So of course, you know, every store had a front door where the customers come in and there's the back door or emergency exit. That's the door where usually goods come in, workers come to work from the back door. Uh, so trading from the uh, back door, in Russian it's called Chorny Chod, so it's like black door, if you translate uh, exactly word for word. So you trade through the back door, uh, through the black door. So the director of uh, Gastronomy Elisevsky created this amazing system of uh, trading from the back door, Chorny Chod, or Ispad Prilavka, from under countertop, and that was, you know, Soviet elite from Moscow, so there would be famous actors, singers, communist elite, all I had to do, they, they just call, say, um, I would like to buy this and that, and uh, they'll get their order ready, they'll come through the back door, or just come through the front door, and they have a spe ready packages ready for them, here you go, and they'll pay some extra on the top of regular price, so this system worked greatly for 10 years. So when the scheme got uncovered, besides OBHSS, KGB got involved because there was a quite a few upper echelon communist apparatchiks and other leaders were blocking investigation. Uh, they arrested director of this gastronome, as I say, Yuri Sokolov. Around 750 other upper management people got arrested and other retail outlets who got involved in all this bribery scheme. Total was about 15,000 people involved with all the schemes. So you're talking about, you know, meat packing factories, fisheries, all the food places that make food because they were getting bribes to ship premium goods to this gastronome. Other stores were involved. So huge, huge scheme. And in the end, it didn't seem like Yuri Sakalov was worried much. He was... Um, uh, tell him he's not guilty, he didn't want to sign any papers, and because he knew that everyone is involved, all the upper uh, Communist Party members were shopping at his store because they liked that everything was there available, it wasn't just like bare shelves like normal Soviet store. But Brezhnev passed away, Andropov came to power, and he was really in the mood to clean up the mess, to clean up all the Brezhnev people, and Yuri Sakalo was one of the victims of that cleanup. Uh, he got shot for his uh, criminal activity. Okay, I have a couple more interesting criminal cases to discuss, but this video already getting um, way too long. I was told that the best format for YouTube videos is around 10 minutes. After that, viewers going to lose attention. So we're going to stop right here, and we're going to make another video about OBHSS and its most uh, impressive criminal cases that they uh, dealt with during the Soviet Union. Today we return back to the topic of OBHSS, the Soviet Economical Financial Crimes Police. And we're gonna look at a couple more famous cases that started in the end of 70s, early 80s, right by the end of the rule of Leonid Brezhnev. First, we're going to look at the so-called caviar case, Ikorna Dela, which was going on in 1979 till 1981. So this caviar case started uh, actually with KGB. They got interested in a couple of uh, comrades. One was Comrade Fieldman, who was a general director of the Ocean uh, Fish Products Trading Company and as well as a director of one of its stores. So this company, like a trading company, had a so-called firmine magazine. So they had retail stores also named Ocean. So that means they sell sea products. So both guys were traveling uh, to the other socialist countries and they got caught smuggling uh, hundreds of thousand rubles into this, like Yugoslavia or Poland or Bulgaria. I already covered the topic of the Soviet tourism and how Soviet people traveled to the other socialist countries. 
and they couldn't bring a lot of money with them. They could buy only like $30 in foreign currency and they could take only a little bit of uh, Soviet rubles with them. So these guys got caught taking hundreds of thousands of rubles with them. So I guess they were just having like a secret vest under regular clothing, smuggling rubles out of the country. And while being in Yugoslavia, for example, they would exchange Soviet rubles to Western hard currencies like American dollars or German Deutschmarks and then illegally deposit them into the Western banks. Apparently, they both were planning to escape from Soviet Union, but they wanted to make sure they had a plenty of money to enjoy Western lifestyle. So they got arrested, and during the investigation and interrogations, KGB found out way, way bigger criminal activity going on besides just smuggling rubles out of the Soviet Union. And that's very impressive. So the main business was they had a small factory in Sochi, which is on the Black Sea. And what they did, paying bribes, they were bringing some illegal black caviar and put it in the cans that were labeled like as a sprouts. Kilka v tomatnom sauce is a tomato sauce sprouts. I think I'm saying this correctly. S-P-R-A-T-S. And then this caviar, which was documented as just cheap fish, was shipped to Yugoslavia. And that was their main income. They were making thousands, if not millions of dollars by illegally smuggling black caviar out of Soviet Union. So after discovering this illegal factory, I think factory was actually legal, but they were just using it illegally. They started following the leads and it went all the way up to Moscow to the Ministry of uh, Fish and Industries. And the second guy in this ministry, so we have a minister, minister, and then uh, I'll say it'd be like vice minister. So Zamistitel Ministra, so second guy got arrested to Vladimir Rytov and he got arrested and later executed for taking a large sums of money, taking large bribes. And while making investigations and arrests in Sochi, that small uh, town on the Black Sea, KGB and local authority discovered more corruption. So that caviar case, the Corona deal is actually kind of like developed into so-called Sochi Krasnodar case where way more people got arrested and sent to prison. Now, when I was researching this topic, some people think that this uh, giant Sochi Krasnodar case was actually Andropov's election campaign so in soviet union when you want to get elected you start going after your rivals and find dirt on them probably sounds familiar so you don't care about being elected by people because in soviet union there'll be central committee committee choosing the next leader so you want to make sure you find dirt on all your opponents so you'll be the only a good candidate to become a leader of Soviet Union. At that time, the first secretary of the Krasnodar Regional Party Committee, committee was uh, Comrade Medunov, who was a very good friend of Brezhnev. And a lot of people thought that he will be a good candidate to replace Brezhnev because in early 80s it was obvious that Brezhnev not going to last long and Meduna was one of the candidates to replace him. So Andropov, who was a KGB chief at that time, sent his top investigators, his best KGB hounds, to find dirt on his opponent, Comrade Medunov. And, surprise, surprise, that wasn't that hard. 
to find some crimes in that town. So the whole Sochi, the whole town was like in panic. And as a result, around 5,000 government officials were fired, excluded from the Communist Party. On the top of it, about 1,500 got arrested and quite a few of them got really lengthy jail times. And Comrade Meduno was fired too, lost his position of first secretary because of corruption. Like they didn't, couldn't prove that he was taking bribes, but because such a corruption was going on under his nose, he was let go too. And this investigation spread to nearby town of Gelenjik, and there they arrested a lady named Berta Barodina, uh, who had a nickname Steel Bella, Zelezna Bella, and she was the main person in charge of all the restaurants and cafeterias in uh, Gilinjik. It's another small town on the shores of Black Sea. When she got arrested, uh, you know, cops went on her house, militia went to her house, and says that her house looked like a museum. It was just packed full of gold and jewels, cash. You know, this is one of the inconveniences of being corrupt person in Soviet Union. You can't buy mansions, you can't buy fancy boats or, you know, expensive cars. So people were just stashing cash or buying gold coins or any other jewelry, jewels. So she actually was canning her cash. She used three liters glass jars and packed them full with cash and then uh, you know, closing the lid, put that metal lid seal in the uh, jar so the moisture won't get and the, the won't destroy cash. So her basement was full of these glass jars full of cash. So as I mentioned, the uh, Zelezna Bella, Steel Bella, was managing all the locals' restaurants and cafeterias, and she was taking bribes uh, from these restaurants to supply them with the better quality alcohol and better quality foods. Then she was taking a cut from everything they were making on the side, like illegally. And what would they do? They would dilute vodka or cognac. They would dilute milk and sour cream with water. They will use less meat, uh, use cheap ingredients. And then all this extra income they had to uh, give a cut to the lady, and of course she was paying uh, bribes up the chain of command. So there was this whole system at work, uh, working, you know, and she was helping them with supplies and getting kickbacks. At the time of her arrest, they found around 500,000 rubles in her house. So we're talking people making average 130 rubles a month in Soviet Union, she had 500,000 rubles at her place. It was estimated that she, through her hands went about 1.5 million rubles uh, doing all this financial cash flow. Apparently, she even provided escort services in Soviet Union. This is crazy. Uh, so if somebody will come uh, to relax by the Black Sea and there will be some girls available, she did that too. So as I mentioned earlier, Bella was arrested and I guess she was expected to get maximum 15 years, but someone was really upset with her, probably Comrade Andropov, uh, so she ended up uh, being executed. She got shot in 1983, so she was the only female in the Soviet Union ever executed for the economical crimes. Total of three women uh, got executed in the Soviet Union. Uh, one was a former Nazi helper, and she was executing uh, Jewish people during the World War II. Other one was poisoning people. It's like she was like a serial killer, but just poisoning people or something else ahead. And Steel Bella was number three, got executed for high criminal uh, activity economical activity and they said she was the only female who got executed for that reason. And of course there were many other cases like for example there's a bunch of people got arrested in Moscow they were paying uh, 
bribes to the local retail outfits like Univermagi and instead of selling goods to the customers, salespeople or director of the retail store would sell to these guys this deficit tavares or deficit goods, whatever be like shoes or electronics. And then they will take those goods and ship them uh, somewhere out to Siberia in the different regions and resell them, make a huge profit. So when it came to retail in Soviet Union, you pretty much can point anyone in any store and they were doing something illegal because there was such a shortage of goods and it just was impossible to resist to make a quick buck. Like I just read some lady, uh, she quit working as a teacher because she was making on like 130 rubles as a teacher. She became a, a salesperson at the store for 80 rubles, but at the same time, she could make additional from 20 to 50 rubles per day in this side business by reselling stuff or whatever. So huge difference just because you had access to goods. And there's another cute details. So, I read also that in 1983, Obahe SS went hardcore chasing Nisuni, those blue collar workers that were carrying stuff out of factories. So, it says they arrested somewhere close to, at least they caught close to like 20,000 people who were smuggling stuff out of their places of work. And the total cost of goods were about 2 million rubles. So 20,000 Nisuni had 2 million uh, rubles worth of goods, while this one single lady had 500,000 rubles in her house. So you could tell the scale was quite, quite different. Well, I was hoping I can wrap up the topic of OBHSS, Soviet Economical Crimes Police, but we still have a couple uh, things to cover, so there'll be another video. So I hope you enjoyed this story. As always, I like your comments, so please post the comments under this video, share with your friends. Today we are returning to the topic of OBHSS, Soviet police fighting against economic and financial crimes. And we're going to talk about Hlopkovaya Dela, or they call it Uzbekskaya Dela, cotton case or Uzbekistan case. Well, at that time, it was Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic, so we didn't really call it Uzbekistan. So Uzbekskaya Uzbek case or cotton case. But before we start digging into the cotton case, we need to learn a new Russian word, or more be like Soviet word, Pripiska. So you can translate it as a doctor records, but usually Pripiska, if you uh, Pripisovash something, if you, so that's like you record additional data. So usually Pripis command that if you pr produced one ton of cotton in this case, you're going to write down that you produced 1.2 tons. So this is Pripiska. When you blow up, you make it a larger number than actual number that you produced. So that was a, Quite a popular way of uh, cooking books or doctoring your records in the Soviet Union. In order to get uh, additional payments or awards, you actually make uh, things look better using Pripiska. So on papers, you were doing way better than in reality. And for those of my viewers that are trying to learn Russian, uh, please make sure you don't confuse Pripiska, doctored records, with Prapiska, which it's your allotted place of living. So in Soviet Union, and I covered that topic in my video number 24. So every Soviet citizen had to have Prapiska had a place of uh, his location that was recorded in his, in his passport. So everyone had a stamp in the passport called Prapiska, which were recorded that that such and such person, such and such comrade, lived in this specific address. So that's Propiska, P-R-O Piska. And Pripiska is P-R-I. So 
Words are very similar, but it's totally different meaning. And today we're talking about pripiska. So, Hlopkova Adela, Cotton case, Uzbek case, and later when more and more details were unearthed, some investigators started calling it Kremlin case. So, it kind of gives you a hint how far it went. It started sometimes in 70s, probably like early and mid 70s. It was going on through 80s. The actual investigation started in 1984 with Andropov and KGB helping OBHSS. And investigation lasted all the way into 1989. So we're talking roughly almost 20 years of cotton case going and then investigations going. Huge, huge, big case. So the location of this cotton case was mainly happening in a country that currently is called Uzbekistan. During the Soviet Union, it was called Uzbekskaya Soviet Socialist Republic. So Uzbek Soviet Socialist Republic. It's one of the southern, more like Central Asian republics. Its size, roughly the size of California. Uzbekistan actually had a quite interesting history, and if you're curious, you can uh, look it up in Wikipedia. They have a, a lot of those things are covered. I don't want just to repeat Wikipedia. Um, what I found interesting is, you know, during the Soviet Union, we had a lot of uh, articles and TV shows talking how United States or uh, Great Britain, uh, they turn third world uh, countries into so-called banana republics. Well, guess what? Moscow turned Uzbekistan into kind of like banana republic, but that was a cotton republic. So they were desperately needed cotton for producing clothing, uh, fabrics and whatsoever. And that was pretty much the only republic that had uh, climate conditions and soil condition to grow cotton. So, in the 70s, there was a major push to increase production of cotton. And Uzbekistan was pretty much, they were pushing down orchards, gardens, and planting cotton almost everywhere. As a result, they used a lot of water uh, from two major rivers, Sir, Sirdaria and Amudaria. And if you look at the map, those are two major rivers that feed Aral Sea. So they use so much water, so rivers basically didn't make it to the Aral Sea, and as a result, Aral Sea started shrinking. And right now, if you look at the map, the roughly I think like 10% of actual it's not actually a sea, it's more like a inland lake, but it has a salt water just like Dead Sea uh, in Israel or Caspi Sea. So this Soviet push to maximize cotton production destroyed Aral Sea, polluted the soil with heavy usage of pesticides and fertilizers. They have a horrible soil contamination. So right now Uzbekistan is paying high price uh, for those good old Soviet days. And another quick side note. If you guys remember several years ago, there was a quite a big uh, fiasco happened in Wells uh, Far uh, Fargo Bank. And... It was the situation when upper management, in order to please investors and push up the share prices, they were really pushing hardcore in all their branches to load up customers with additional services. So they had a target that every customer of Wells Fargo Bank should have at least five different accounts, which is, which is hardcore, right? So, if you don't meet the quota on your in your branch, you'll get fired. You got let go. So what started happening? Wells Fargo personnel started just adding bank accounts uh, to customers without even their knowledge. They first used up all their relatives, and they were adding themselves bank accounts, and then they went off to customers because they wanted to protect their job, their income. So they were doing pripiskas, right? Kind of like similar things. So quite similar thing happened in Uzbekistan. 
because Moscow was pushing so hard to increase production of cotton. So, cotton case big picture. Moscow, which means Leonid Brezhnev, really wanted to increase cotton production. So they were pushing the communist leader of Uzbekistan, Sharaf Rashidov, to increase production. So Rashidov, who of course wanted to keep his position, started pushing down the chain to local communist leaders and then of course all the way down to the collective farm leaders about increasing the cotton production. So of course first reaction was they started increasing the areas of planting cotton then when it was time to harvest they didn't have enough equipment so they were just using anybody who had two hands and two legs or at least one leg to go and harvest by hand the cotton in the fall. So schools uh, pupils, they didn't attend school, they were sent to the fields, pregnant women, college students, people from the cities, everyone had was forced to go and handpick cotton to meet this quota. So they drastically increased cotton production, something to like 4 million tons per year, but Moscow wanted even more, so Brezhnev asked Rashidov, Comrade Rashidov, is there any way you can do five and a half million ton? And Komar Rashidov said, yes, we can. So pretty much what started happening, so down to the chain of command, there was the message, I don't care what you do, I need five and a half million tons of cotton. So he went all the way down to a collective farm, and the collective farm produced, for example, 10 tons. They said, we don't care, you need to produce 15 tons. And that's when... Pripiska started. They started changing paperwork and reporting that yes, we produce so much cotton. And then, of course, you send cotton to be processed. So now you got to talk to those people and explain the situation why on the paper said that you shipped 15 ton, although only 10 times arrived. And then bribes started. So eventually, by mid-70s, early 80s, there was this bizarre self-feeding system got created, which involved Uzbekistan communist leadership, Moscow, and then, of course, collective farms and uh, local leaders in Uzbekistan, because they reported harvests way higher than actually happened. Moscow paid for all those paper cotton that never existed, money that Moscow paid got split and went to bribe around. Then those bribes started working back up in the chain to pay people to keep their mouth shut. And then these bribes were kind of returning back to Moscow. So I call it like this interesting Soviet 69 situation when both parties, Uzbekistan and Moscow, were satisfying each other by circulating the money and stealing pretty much from the state. In fact, Comrade Brezhnev was very, very pleased, extremely happy to announce to the whole world that, look, the socialist collective farms are way more effective than any farms in America because look at the amount of cotton we produce. So, like, we show this insane insane amount of cotton coming out from Uzbekistan. So they were very proud to show their successes in Moscow. And that was one of the reasons why, although there were first kind of things were happening, first maybe questions, because, you know, KGB could notice here and there, OBHSS could catch some kind of things, that something was going on, but because Comrade Brezhnev was really happy. No one wanted to make him upset and uh, tell him what's happening in reality. So nothing was going on all the way to 1984 when Brezhnev passed away. I think Brezhnev died in 83 and Andropov, former KGB leader, became a leader of the Soviet Union. So let's take a quick look to understand how this Soviet 69 was working between Moscow and Uzbekistan. So, Kalhoz reports that they harvested 15 million, 15 million, 15 tons of cotton, and they get paid for 15 tons of cotton. In reality, they produced only 10. So, they got extra money for 5 tons of cotton, and 
guess it was a lot of money. So now trucks are taking cotton to the processing factory and they take a case with cash to pay manager of the factory, uh, pay the uh, chief engineer, chief technologist to close eyes that they got less cotton that on, on the paper. So of course those price lists. So I found out that if they ship by train, so for example, there'll be 10 cargo cars with cotton, one will be empty. So the price of it to accept empty uh, cargo car was 10,000 rubles. So that was the price tag to process invisible cotton. So the main headache was actually on these processing plants because they needed somehow to explain why after accepting 15 tons of cotton to process, as a result, they will produce only, you know, so much pure cotton, which doesn't match their initial 15 tons. And so they had to change some kind of like their technology and claim that way more cotton being a loss due, due to the drying process. Then they had to change the standards. So some cotton that used to go to waste because just poor quality, now they come up that it still can be used. Then they actually set up their warehouses on fire. So there'll be empty warehouse, which suddenly will catch fire by accident. And then they'll claim that, you know, 50 tons of cotton burned down. So this is one of the reasons why we didn't produce enough. And as I mentioned in one of my previous videos, Communist Party was like a parallel system controlling the economic life of Soviet Union. So every communist leader had to be paid too to keep his eyes closed to the situation because they were aware of what's going on too. So I said, from the bottom of the collective farmer leader and up to the processing and shipping, and then of course, it went further to other factories that were using cotton. So they were claiming, hey, we shipped them so much. And then they had to claim on some losses. So this whole system was just recirculating cash. And as a result, Soviet Union, like a state, lost huge amount of money because of these prepiskas that were happening for years. So I said, it was discovered around 1984. I mean... They knew about it earlier, but when they started actually doing investigation, arresting people, they found out that the scale was just enormous, just mind-boggling. So from 1978 to 1983, there were prepiska around 4.5 million ton of cotton. And picture cotton, 4.5 million ton. Never existed. And then it was still going on later, so total amount was close to 10 million ton of cotton was added and paid. So Soviet state, Soviet government actually lost somewhere around 10 billion rubles in this cotton case, which I don't know how to even translate to dollars, a huge amount of money. According to the records, what I uh, found... The ball got rolling actually when they KGB arrested uh, local Oberhss. So the guy actually, the economic and financial crimes police, the local uh, chief, was arrested, Comrade Muzaffarov, uh, because uh, he demanded thousand rubles bribe and some sexual favors for the lady. She got mad and complained to KGB. They arrested the guy. They didn't think nothing like big about it but then when they searched his house they found 1.5 million rubles so they realized there's something really big going on so a guy started singing and they started arresting as a result they sent 3,000 investigators to Uzbekistan they arrested thousands of people close to 4,000 people in the end went to jail Total was around 800 criminal cases, and of course each case involved 20, 40 people. So as I said, out of uh, 800 cases, close to 4,000 people actually were uh, jailed. Quite a few people shot themselves before they got arrested. They confiscated millions of rubles. They were uh, confiscating golden coins, 
uh, like one guy they found 110 kilos of gold and you know it's Uzbekistan so they were hiding their cash and gold in bidone so this big uh, aluminum giant jugs for milk they'll just uh, fill them full with gold coins or cash and then bury them so that was insane so out of this 4,000 people jailed there was like 433 Kalhoz or Safhoz managers, so that's the lowest level of people involved. Then you had 85 directors of cotton processing plants. Then you had about 400 deputies, uh, deputati, so the elected officials. Then there was the like a local, I couldn't say company, but it was the God Hlopkom Prom. So that's the company that handled all the purchases of cotton in Uzbekistan. Every single person there was arrested and jailed. All found guilty, all found taken bribes. First Secretary of the Central Committee of Uzbekistan. All first secretaries of every single region of Uzbekistan. And it went all the way to Moscow, and the top guy that got arrested was Yuri Churbanov, uh, who was the top, like, militia, MVD leader and he was Brezhnev son-in-law so this is the chain of command that involved uh, was working on this corruption in the beginning of the story I mentioned Sharaf Rashidov who was the first secretary of communist party of Uzbekistan and he was a twice hero of the socialist labor he was one of the Brezhnev's favorite buddies but when Andropov came to power and started working this Uzbekistan case Rashida realized that he's in big trouble and he committed suicide and uh, shot himself. And also, as I mentioned earlier, investigation started in 1984 and went all the way to 1989. So it went through Andropov, then Andropov died. Uh, Chernyanka was at power, Chernyanka died, then Gorbachev came to power. And as I mentioned, uh, one of the uh, chief investigators... Uh, on this case, Glan, he actually told Gorbachev that you can't call it cotton case or Uzbek case. It's actually Kremlin case. And Gorbachev didn't like that. And uh, it actually, they almost got themselves in trouble. They, there was a criminal case against chief investigators because they were using excessive force or whatever. So they almost got arrested too. So here's a quick and dirty review of the ill-famous cotton case, Uzbek case, Kremlin case that was happening in the 80s. And it's one of the reasons why I am keep on telling that you need to be very, very careful and very, very skeptical about any numbers that were produced during the Soviet Union era. Because quite often people, my viewers, claim that I'm a liar, that look at the numbers, Soviet Union was doing great here, or doing great there, the economy grew, you know, people were happy. This is an example why you shouldn't trust any Soviet statistics, any Soviet numbers, because in Soviet Union numbers carried political weight. So you should be really skeptical about all these numbers, because I said, look at this cotton case, we were producing so much cotton on the paper and uh, when reality actually was discovered it, it was way worse and it was very very ugly well i hope you guys enjoyed this video and i hope you learned something new and before i say goodbye or do svidania or dot spitania i would like to thank everyone who purchased my book american diaries and i want you to ask you and remind you please post the review on Amazon. It's regardless if you bought it on Amazon or directly from me, if you wanted a signed copy. If you're a customer of Amazon, you can still post a review on the book. So I got over 50 books sold right now, but only six reviews in America and two in Great Britain. So please, if you have a minute, uh, go on Amazon.com and post a review for my book. It will be greatly appreciated. And thank you for watching my channel. We'll talk to you soon. До свидания. Goodbye.